This video is sponsored by Card Kingdom. If you click on the link in the description below, it'll take you to their store and they'll know I sent you there. Hello everyone, I'm Need to Hone, and it's Wednesday, so that means it's time for another MTG Top 10. As usual, right after a new set has been fully spoiled, I do a full set review for Limited, and during that week, usually one of my MTG Top 10s is taken over sort of by that Limited review because I use it to look at the biggest bombs for Draft and Sealed. And that's what we're doing here today. These are going to be my 10 picks for the most powerful cards in the set, the cards you most want to see in your Sealed pull or in a Pack 1, Pick 1 scenario. Bombs are so powerful that they not only can completely warp a game in your favor, you should also consider warping your draft around one if you manage to see one, even if you see it a little bit late. Now, obviously, all the cards in this video are going to be rare or mythic rare, but if you're interested in hearing me talk about all the cards in this set, including the commons, uncommons, the ones that are the best, and so forth, I also did a set review, as I mentioned, and you should be able to find a link to that in the description below. All right, let's get started by looking at our first bomb. At number 10, I have Thrix, the Sudden Storm. He makes the list primarily just because he's so incredibly efficient and because he has Flash. A 5-mana 4-5 with Flying and Flash is going to take over a lot of games, even if you ignore the rest of the text on him. It's not that hard to get a 2-for-1 when you have a creature this large with Flash, because he's going to be bigger than most creatures, and that means it's not that hard to Flash him in and block something and kill it, something like a 4-4, and then he can sort of hang around on the board, start attacking your opponent, or, you know, maybe they eventually use a removal spell on him, but if that's the case, they're still getting two for one. The rest of the text on him will come up, but it's not going to come up all the time. Uh, you certainly don't want to jam as many five mana cards as you can into your deck just because of that, because not being able to be countered isn't that exciting anyway in Limited. It will come up some, but the best part about it is just reducing the cost. But if he can do that once or twice a game, in addition to just being a huge win condition that can also just flash in and kill things, uh, he's going to be pretty great. At number 9, I have Uro, Titan of Nature's Wrath. Both of the Gold Titans are on this list, and they are both certainly bombs. With Uro, in a worst-case scenario, you're paying 3 mana to gain 3 life and draw a card and put an extra land onto the battlefield, assuming you have one. And that's not a bad fail case. It's not a great one, but the fact that later in the game, Uro can just come back as a huge creature that will also uh, be doing that same effect every time it attacks and when it enters the battlefield again is pretty great. Now, I do have it lower on this list than I think some people might, but that's because I think people are overrating a little bit just how easy it will be to cast these out of your graveyard. Between the double-colored mana and needing the cards in your graveyard, sometimes it's going to be a little bit of a challenge. I'm not saying it will be difficult, it's just not going to pan out where you're doing this on turn 4 basically ever in Limited. If you do, it's going to be awesome. It's usually going to be later on in the game once you're able to do it, which is still really great, don't get me wrong, but I think it does hold it back from being the best bomb in the format. Both of these Titans would be a lot better, obviously, if they were easier to cast and, you know, didn't have escape. But of course they have to, because if they didn't, they'd be completely ridiculous instead of just, you know, one of the biggest bombs in the entire set. At number 8, I have Kroxa, Titan of Death's Hunger, which is, of course, the other gold titan. Like Uro, he does something when he comes into play, he does something when he attacks, and he doesn't stay in play unless you escape him. You can't cast him and have him stay in play. They're both 6-6s six as well. In the case of Kroxa, he goes after your opponent's hand and punishes them if they don't discard something that's actually a real card. In other words, if they discard a land or nothing... They lose three life so he hits really hard he doesn't draw you cards the way uro does or gain you life instead he goes after your opponent's hand and life but like uro escaping croxa titan of death's hunger won't just be something you can do on turn four very often it's going to be something that happens later in the game turn seven eight nine and of course when you do you're going to just completely take over the game and that's what makes him a bomb but it does mean he's a little lower on this list than some of the other bombs in the set next up we have a god nylea keen-eyed so I actually only have two gods on this list that I consider to be straight up bombs. They're all really good, but I think only two are bombs. And the two that I have on here are both pretty good, even in a world where you never get your devotion high enough for them to be a creature. In the case of Nylea, she reduces the cost of creature spells and has the ability to just draw you cards. It's, she has a great mana sync ability that you can use 
all game long whenever you have spare mana and it's going to give you a ton of value if you just imagine this as an enchantment that does those two things it would be a pretty good card but of course like all the gods if devotion gets high enough she becomes a huge indestructible creature not something that's very easy to deal with in this format either if you need to use her as a blocker or attacker She's just going to take over games a lot of the time, especially when you get to the middle part of the game and you can just sink mana into that ability. And she kind of works well with herself because if you're using that ability, chances are good that you're going to rip through more of your deck and get your devotion higher as you hit green creatures and the like. So yeah, I really like Nylea. She's going to win people a lot of games. Next up, it's Erebos Blackhearted, the other god to make the list. Like Nylea, Erebos has abilities that are amazing even if he were just an enchantment. The ability to draw a card every time one of your creatures dies is incredible and limited. Yes, you have to pay two life, but every time one of your creatures is capable of replacing itself, it's going to be incredible. Imagine just trading one of your creatures for one of your opponents, and you get to draw a card. That's what makes every trade into a two-for-one, and that's just amazing. On top of that, he has a fairly powerful activated ability that allows you to cash in creatures to give minus two, minus one to things, which of course means you can also pay those two life and draw a card every time you do it. This format has ways to make tokens, it has a sacrifice deck in the black red deck, and you can actually get extra synergy out of that ability in that case. And then of course, again, if your devotion gets high enough, he's a huge creature. And also like Nylea, the fact that he draws you extra cards does mean that maybe you're going to be able to get your devotion high enough if it isn't already a little more easily because you're going to be cashing in like tokens who don't add to your devotion at all and drawing cards which will hopefully add to your devotion. Erebos is just an insane value engine and something that I know I'm going to have a lot of fun playing with in this format, should I ever actually see him. At number 5, I have Pelucranos, Unchained. On the face of it, this is a 4-mana 6-6. Six, six. It's already some really great stats, but he also comes with the ability to fight things, which is what makes him really incredible. He's a removal spell attached to a huge creature. Now, he does lose plus 1 plus 1 counters when he's fighting or taking damage in any way, so it's not like he can just fight indefinitely. He'd be kind of ridiculous if he could. But the fact that he's just like a huge creature that's a problem for your opponent that can also just screw everything up all the time, like your opponent really has to be afraid just of the threat of activation of that fight effect because it will cause so many problems in the middle of combat and if they're trying to cast auras and instants, and that's really crazy. But then on top of all of that, he can come back from your graveyard because he has escape later on in the game, he can come back, and he comes back as a 12-12, capable of hitting harder and fighting a lot more things thanks to the additional plus one plus one counters. Pelucranos will just be taking over games between the fact that he's an incredibly efficient creature and he has the ability to just fight whatever he wants to and can kill lots and lots of creatures. And on top of that, he has recursion that brings him back even larger. Yeah, he's incredible. And number four, it's Nightmare Shepherd. On its own, it's a four mana, four, four flyer. That's a really good card in limited. That alone can take over games sometimes. Your opponent has to have removal for that or usually they're dead. But Nightmare Shepherd brings a lot more to the table because of the ability to when any one of your non-token creatures die, that creature gets exiled, and you get a 1-1 copy of it in play, except it's a nightmare. And that means, if it's a copy, that means it has all of the abilities of the creature, that means keyword abilities, static abilities, activated abilities. So there's going to be some really weird, crazy board states in this format where you have all of these 1-1 nightmare copies of cards with various other abilities. Even if he just made a 1-1 token every time one of your creatures died, and exiled that creature that would still be a pretty good card and probably still would have made the list so it probably would have been lower but this is even better because it makes them actual copies of the cards except for you know creature type and power and toughness and you might think you know the exile thing is a bit of a downside and you're not exactly wrong you know if you have pelucranos you don't really want him to get exiled but it's a may clause so in those cases if you really want to hold on to a creature in your graveyard and you'd rather have it there than get a 1-1 nightmare copy of it you can do that if that's what you want to do. And I like that that's a May Clause a lot. So yeah, Nightmare Shepherd going to be attacking hard in the air and making all kinds of silly copies of creatures that die. And number three, it's Archon of Sun's Grace. Like Nightmare Shepherd, if you take away everything on this card except for its stats and its keyword abilities, it would still be quite a good card. Not a bomb, it'd be a 4 mana 3 4 flying and lifelink, so that's not a bomb, but it's a very good card. Another one that if you can't kill it, at some point it's going to take over the game, but it comes with all this other text. Your Pegasus creatures get lifelink. And there aren't that many Pegasus creatures in this set, but he also has Constellation, and every time you play an enchantment, you get a 2-2 white Pegasus that will also have lifelink and flying. So Archon of Sun's Grace just churns out these Pegasus tokens, which won't be that hard to do. There's lots of enchantments in this set, 
He's also a really good place to be sticking auras and things like that because of the keyword abilities. And yeah, I mean, even if you only make one, two, two out of this, you are in business and usually you're going to be able to make more than one. This is a must kill. It will end the game quickly if you don't kill it. And number two, it's Ashiok Nightmare Muse. Most sets have one super crazy pushed planeswalker, one really big bomby planeswalker, and in limited at least, that's Ashiok Nightmare Muse. Any planeswalker who has the ability to protect themselves, like Ashiok, can do with two, three nightmare creature tokens that can be made by raising loyalty, and has the ability to impact the board on the opponent's side of the table, which Ashiok can do with the minus three ability, which can bounce things. And if you're bouncing things when your opponent has no cards in their hand, that card gets exiled. Even if they have other cards in their hand, the fact that you get to bounce something and exile a card in their hand is pretty amazing. And then there's an ultimate that gets set up by both the plus one and minus three because those two, three nightmare tokens exile stuff from the opponent's library every time they attack and block. And then the ultimate lets you take some of the cards you've exiled, three of them, and cast them for free. So Ashiok will have no problem making tokens that keeps their loyalty high enough and then also impacting the opponent's side of the board. It's a lot of great value for five mana, especially starting at five loyalty. Ashiok's going to be very, very difficult to beat in this format. Basically, the only way you can is if you have several evasive creatures, because if you only have one, Ashiok can just come into play and bounce it and give your opponent time to figure out a way to deal with that flyer and keep Ashiok alive. If you only have ground creatures, it's going to be incredibly difficult to ever successfully attack Ashiok. And that's the thing, even in a fail case here, Ashiok's gonna make like a couple of tokens, exile some cards and die. And uh, that's a lot of value for a fail case and the success case, which will happen more often, is just that the game will be over when you play Ashiok. And at number one, it's Dream Trawler. If you want a card to play against, it's going to make you feel absolutely helpless or absolutely safe, depending on whether or not you're the one who casts it, that's going to be Dream Trawler. Dream Trawler doesn't have the most impressive base stats, it's only a 6 mana 3-5 with flying and lifelink, but Dream Trawler gets bigger when you draw cards, Dream Trawler draws you cards, and Dream Trawler can gain hexproof. So Dream Trawler will usually be attacking at least as a 5 mana 5-5 five five with flying and lifelink. That's impossible to race. It's difficult to block because of the flying. And then the Trawler will also be drawing you extra cards, which you can hold on to, to cast in to give it Hexproof until end of turn. Now, the Trawler does have to tap down, and thank God it does, because if it didn't at least have to do that, it would be a complete nightmare to play against. But at least if your opponent's almost dead, you can like cast a removal spell on it just to get it tapped down and then attack them for the win. But it's still going to be very, very difficult to deal with. And even just getting hit by this a couple of times means your opponent has drawn two extra cards and gained 10 life. So good luck with that. Now, the Dream Trawler does have a difficult mana cost. And for a while, I thought about whether or not I wanted to put it even lower. But I think it's just so powerful and you're going to feel so helpless against it that it's basically the textbook definition of a bomb. And despite that mana cost, it's going to be the biggest bomb in this set and the card you most want to see pack one, pick one or in your sealed pools. Dream Trawler is awesome, and I'm glad it's rare instead of Mythic Rare, sort of, because it means you have more of a chance to play with it, but it also means you'll play against it more, so I guess maybe it's a wash. Well, that does it for this MTG Top 10. If you enjoyed this video, don't forget to like it and share it so that others can enjoy it too. If you want to make sure you catch future MTG Top 10s, don't forget to subscribe. And if you want to make sure you've seen all of my MTG Top 10s, you should see the playlist on your screen now. Thanks for watching.